I'm Dr. Kathleen Mollis, New York City-based audiologist, also known as Ear Doc of TikTok, and I'm here to answer all of your ear questions. So very happy to be here with Luke today. I hear you all have some great questions for me. So being noise sensitive, it could take two different forms. So people could have hyperacusis, which is just like a general sensitivity to loud sounds, like a blanket sensitivity, or people could have misophonia, which is like a really emotional disturbance and annoyance to a particular sound. So in general, it's very disruptive to people's lives because there is noise everywhere in general. So if you are more sensitive to it, just getting through your regular day can be very difficult for this population. Noise can have a lot of repercussions like across your full life, quality of life, emotional health, physical health, and there's been a lot of focus on this lately. And it's because, you know, health-wise, it leads to higher blood pressure, higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, you can be more agitated, more depressed, more anxious. There's a lot of effects of noise on your health. And then that's not even counting what it does to your ears. It's not good for your hearing at all. Misophonia is complicated because it's one of those things that's hard to pin down. You know, is it an ear related thing? Is it a brain thing? Is it something that should be dealt with by a psychologist or an audiologist? And uh, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done about it because we don't know enough about it yet to really be able to manage it well. Um, and again, misophonia is this emotional disturbance to a, to a particular sound. So the most common ones are chewing or um, someone clicking a pen, you know, really common little things that are annoying to most people, but it's like intolerable to, to people that actually have it. So the interesting thing is uh, that the onset of it is usually in your teenage years. The average onset is like 12, 13, 14 years old. So I think there's also this fear that people won't be taken seriously when they report having it because there's a lot of other things going on around that age. And it tends to really peak in college and we see it more with women than men for some reason. But beyond that, there's still a lot that needs to be investigated about it. I think it really falls more into the psychology camp personally than the audiology camp. Um, just because it does seem like you really have to control the reaction to it more so than um, actually addressing the input or the, the actual stimulus uh, that would be more of the audiology side. They go hand in hand. Sensory overload, uh, certainly people report that auditory stimulus is part of it. They definitely sounds are a big part of this sensory overload. And that could be like it, you're in a meeting, someone's clicking their pen, someone's chewing gum, someone's eating a snack, whatever it is, and you have all these really annoying triggers going on, can make it really hard for you to focus. So it could be misophonia. It could also just be this general hyperacusis, again, because of all of the sounds around you. So they are all under the umbrella, I would say, of sensory issues, sensory disorders. So for misophonia, um, this is where there's some overlap with tinnitus, which is the ringing and buzzing in your ears, that both of them, there are some things that again, fall within the audiology scope of practice, but a lot um, will also fall into the psychology or the cognitive behavioral therapy, really, of we want to control your reaction to these things and make sure that these sounds are no longer so triggering for you. And that's like a trained behavior, which is why it can be better done by psychologists sometimes. So tinnitus, certainly that's true. Misophonia, that's true. If we talk about hyperacusis and the sensitivity to loud sounds, that does fall more firmly in the audiology camp. It can be helpful to reduce the stimulation or how much input you're getting, which is where earplugs come in handy. Um, but you wanna make sure that you're careful with what kind of earplugs you're going to be wearing because you don't want it to be too powerful, essentially. You don't want it to totally block out the sounds because then you're just sidestepping the issue and you're ignoring what is what the problem is instead of developing that tolerance of being able to handle it. So you actually want uh, earplugs that let some sound in. It's the same principle when you go to a concert. You want to hear what you, what you are going there for. You want to hear the music. So you want to get that stimulation, but just um, 
to a level that is tolerable for you, which is where the earplugs come in. It will lower it so it's not quite as triggering for you. Take the edge off. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to AirPods or headphones or anything like that, absolutely. And this is something that um, has been a high priority for audiologists lately and then it's really been gaining more attention like world health organizations now involved there's all of these studies coming out and there was a big study that was released in uh december i believe that showed that 1 billion young adults age 16 through 35 are at risk for a permanent um, hearing loss due to unsafe listening habits. So all of this is self-inflicted. It's people that are not using their headphones appropriately. And, you know, AirPods, headphones, are having cell phones in general, all great, but our ears were not built to have to tolerate that long of noise exposure and certainly not that direct of noise exposure. So it certainly is something that needs to be talked about. And I think a lot of people, it's a lack of education. They don't know that they are permanently damaging their hearing loss and it's fully preventable. All you have to do is lower the volume and make sure that you're paying attention to both how loud you're listening and how long you're listening for. As far as um, putting anything in your ears, you also have to think about your ear health. So this goes for earplugs, in-ear headphones, anything that's going inside your body, you need to think about how clean it is. And I think that it's pretty disturbing when I see people's AirPods and I look at them and how dirty they are, or people's earplugs and I ask them, how long have you been using them? And they say they've been wearing them every day for a year. That's a problem. You are introducing a lot of bacteria into your ear and your ear is designed to be a moist and dark place, which is a breeding ground for infection. So um, if anything is going in your ear, you need to make sure you're cleaning it regularly. That is just standard health practices. <laughs> Earwax, first of all, is a good thing. A lot of people want to take it out of their ears. People love the feeling of Q-tips and I can't really blame them. Like everyone has used Q-tips. Audiologists, we always say you shouldn't use Q-tips. Audiologists will sometimes use Q-tips. And uh, I think it's just a lack of education there too, where we think that it's uh, a hygiene thing, that, that our ears are dirty, therefore we should clean them. Or we took a shower, therefore we should dry our ears. And uh, really, earwax is there to clean our ears for us. It is a protective mechanism for the ear. So it keeps a certain pH level in the ear um, that again, makes sure that uh, bacteria can't grow in there. It really makes it sort of a hostile environment for, for any sort of infection. Um, and then it also evolutionarily it served the purpose of preventing any sort of bugs or foreign bodies from entering your ear. So that's the backstory of earwax. What happens to your ear when you are using Q-tips is you are preventing earwax from coming out naturally, which is what it's supposed to do. It will come out naturally on its own and with it, it will bring some um, you know, dead skin cells and any, anything in the ear that shouldn't be in there, it will clean it out. When you use a Q-tip, you're pushing it back in, you're going to create more wax in the ear and you're gonna essentially create an earplug in your ear of just wax. And wax is very dense, it is hard for sound to get through it. So you're gonna create a hearing loss um, unintentionally. So certainly wax can have a big impact on your hearing. The good news is that it's usually temporary. But for most people, you won't get to that point if you don't use Q-tips. Some people genetically just produce more wax than others. Um, so you might need to get it professionally removed every once in a while. But um, other than that, just leave them alone. So you can, that's definitely a potential risk that you should be aware of. It certainly doesn't make it a strong enough argument to not use earplugs. Using earplugs and protecting your hearing definitely trumps the potential of pushing wax in, in my opinion. Um, but you could because you are, again, preventing the natural migration of wax out of your ears. So it's the same thing. Um, when people wear headphones all the time, you know, they have their AirPods in all day, we are preventing the wax from coming out of the ear. So you, um, you might be more likely to get a buildup of wax. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, but again, that is not a reason to not use earplugs. 
Yes, I would say definitely safe to use earplugs on a daily basis. And I know a lot of people need to, um, and that's totally fine. I would try to not wear them all day. I would make sure that you are cleaning them regularly. And I would make sure that um, if you are noticing a buildup of wax, either because it's coming out on the plug itself or you feel like your hearing is muffled or your ear feels clogged, then um, just see a doctor about it. Could be your primary, an ENT, an, an audiologist, whomever, and get it professionally removed. So for concerts, um, you want to make sure you're using the right kind of earplugs because concert music, that's a very different stimulus um, or signal than what construction workers are trying to block out. There's a lot of different kinds of noise out there and music that is a good kind of noise. But the thing with music is that, of course, you want to hear all of the different dynamics. You want to hear all the different instruments. It's usually very familiar to you. That's why you're going to concerts. So it, you want it to sound true to what it is. So what you want to make sure is that you have an earplug that has flat attenuation. And what we mean by that is that it has an equal effect on all the different pitches or frequencies, which you see in what we usually refer to as musicians plugs, but any kind of um, earplug that has a certain kind of filter in it, that makes sure that it's going to be that flat attenuation rather than like the dense foam plugs that will cause distortion because it will have a greater effect at certain pitches than others and then it just won't sound right to you and then what's the point of going to a concert so after you go to a concert a lot of people say they feel like their hearing is down they might have some ringing or buzzing in the ears tinnitus so the muffled sensation feeling like your hearing is down and that your ears are actually full uh, that is a temporary threshold shift so your ear is not it's not built to really endure really loud volumes which is powerful sound waves if you think about it and inside your ear so there's your cochlea your hearing organ and inside your cochlea there are, are these tiny little hair cells that have cilia up top that that is the mvp of the hearing system they are responsible for sensing everything in the environment and then uh, funneling it down into um, an impulse along the auditory nerve so if these hair cells aren't responding appropriately then you're not going to be as sensitive to sound that is what hearing loss is at its core is changes to the hair cells so these little cilia they um, sort of get overpowered with this very, very large sound wave and it damages them temporarily. So they are not as sensitive and they can't send as much information up to your brain, which is a threshold shift. We call it temporary because um, after a concert, your thresholds will usually come back up. So if you did a hearing test right after a concert, your hearing might be down. If you came back a couple of days later, it would probably be up if it were a true temporary threshold shift. And then along with it, the feeling of fullness would, would go away also. The problem is that even if your hearing is coming back up, the temporary threshold shift can have this really sort of hidden damage um, that it's doing over the long term. And a bunch of temporary threshold shifts can add up to a permanent threshold shift, which is what we call noise-induced hearing loss. And that is what the 1 billion people are at risk for right now based off of that last study. So it is all related to the damage that the way too loud sounds are doing to those hair cells. And if you're lucky, those hair cells will bounce right back up. If you're not, then those hair cells are still down and that's going to be a permanent hearing loss. I would tell them that they should be worried if it lasts more than a couple of days. That is probably a sign that something permanent happened and that perhaps that one noise exposure was way too powerful or that was the last straw of you've just been doing this too long and you've gone too many times to a concert unprotected. Exercising can cause both hearing loss and tinnitus, not exercising directly, but what you do when you're exercising. So if you're listening to music when you are exercising, you are more likely to keep it at a higher volume than you would be if you were just, um, you know, 
sitting down listening or if you were you know working and you're listening to music usually like if you're out for a run or something you're going to be bringing it above your heavy breathing so you're going to be listening at a higher volume or you'll be bringing it above the car traffic or whatever you're hearing when you get to that point you have to make sure that you're keeping it at a safe level which you're probably really towing that line pretty finely so spin classes have been shown to be extremely loud dangerously loud louder than construction sites or other places that are regulated at least here in the united states you know about noise exposure and the need for hearing protection which i think is this really weird thing that you know we talk about health and everything and all these fitness instructors preach a healthy lifestyle and then what do they do they blast you with music which is the worst thing you could possibly do for your hearing so in that regard yes it can um, and then certainly whenever you're exposing yourself to really loud volumes and that level of noise tinnitus is always a possibility but exercise alone no Thing. So there are things that can happen to your ears when you are exercising and that's a little more vestibular related. So your balance system, so weightlifting or lifting up anything heavy when you're like holding your breath and you're creating all this pressure in your head, there is one particular kind of ear injury that you could get. Um, but that is pretty rare. It's um, it's a version of barotrauma or essentially a, a pressure issue in your ear. Same sort of thing that you would see with like scuba diving. But again, that would be more, it would result in a dizziness and not so much a, a hearing issue necessarily. This is sort of a split camp. Some people think it is great that you should be wearing earplugs if you have tinnitus and that it will help you. And then other people think that it makes it a whole lot worse. So I think what's important for people to understand is that tinnitus is an internal sound. So tinnitus is this like phantom sound that your brain is creating because it's expecting to get more stimulation from the outside environment, which is why you can have an increase in tinnitus when you have hearing loss because your ears are not sending as robust of a message up to your brain as it's expecting to get. So it essentially creates a sound to keep itself busy because it thinks it's missing something. So if the tinnitus is coming from inside your brain, then really what you're wearing earplugs for is uh, to block out external sounds. It's sort of an apples and oranges situation where it's not really talking about the same thing. Um, and they can actually work against each other. So for some people, um, wearing earplugs will actually make the tinnitus worse because you are taking away all of the external sounds or a good amount of them. You're really bringing them down, which brings their tinnitus to the forefront and actually makes it more bothersome. And part of that is because whenever you block up your ears, it amplifies internal sounds. It's called the occlusion effect. For other people, maybe bringing the edge off of the external sounds, but still allowing some of it in creates a better balance for them. So with tinnitus, it actually becomes more pronounced or more bothersome when people are stressed or when they are tired um, or when they haven't eaten well, um, all of them can cause tinnitus spikes. So in that way, earplugs could be helpful because you're lowering the noise, you're reducing that, stimulus that could cause stress and anxiety but then you still have the tinnitus so it's a trade-off between you know how are we reducing the stress and are you reducing it enough to make the tinnitus also become less apparent to you but i would think more commonly it would be that first group where it would actually make it worse one of the best things you can do for your ears and specifically your hearing is to wear earplugs. And it's a little thing that's super easy to do. It's not expensive to do. It's a very passive mechanism. There's really no barriers to it, but not enough people are doing it. And the reason that it is so important is because when you are wearing an earplug, you are um, reducing the noise that you are exposed to. So when you are being exposed to sounds above a certain volume, in the United States, 85 dB is like a hard cutoff. That's a very loud volume. Above that, we get nervous about damage 
And that includes whether it's factory workers or you're at a concert, noise is noise. But when you are above that volume, you could be damaging your hearing and the louder it is, the faster that damage is going to happen. So when you wear earplugs, you're going to um, essentially lower that volume. So you're wearing them in your ears and when it goes through the earplugs, the, uh, the sound signal that's actually getting to your cochlea and the hearing organ is going to be lower, it will be safer, which means you can enjoy certain environments that would be too loud for you to be in without them, like a concert. So it's really important for the prevention, both of hearing loss and tinnitus, because both of them are related to noise exposure and that noise-induced hearing loss that so many people are at risk for is permanent and it's just silly because it is fully preventable. All you have to do is wear earplugs and watch what volume you're listening to music at. Um, and then tinnitus we know is very much related to damage in the ears. So if you have damage in the ears from noise, you're more likely to develop tinnitus. So you're reducing your risk of that as well with earplugs. Custom earplugs and then loop, um, I sort of think of them as two different categories, sort of. Um, they're both doing the same thing. They are both lowering the volume again to make sure that you are listening in a safe range to reduce any damage to your ears. Um, the custom hearing protection, I think that comes in handy for some people that have unusually shaped ears or perhaps are really bothered with the occlusion effect or um, that feeling of being plugged up and their own voice seems amplified. And um, the reason that custom hearing protection can be good for that is because we are putting it so far into the ear that once you get to the bony part of your ear canal, half of your ear canal is bony, half of it is cartilaginous or made of cartilage. Once you get into that bony segment, you won't get as much of that occlusion effect. But for a lot of people, um, I think loop or any more generic earplug works just fine. And that is because it's still the same amount of power, the same amount of noise reduction. And if it fit isn't an issue, you know, you can try the different tips, you can get a good fit and it's still going to do the same job. So I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. There might just be uh, certain people that might have a preference, but I wouldn't really make it a blanket statement of one being better. For choosing hearing protection, you want to think about what are you protecting your hearing from? What is the stimulus? So that's why you see um, people that are working on construction sites with the big earmuffs. They have to protect their hearing to a very different stimulus and a different volume. It's a different signal that's coming into your ear. So you need to make sure that the hearing protection is going to address that sort of signal. If you want to protect for music or to really be able to enjoy music, then you wanna make sure you have something with those filters in it to really make sure you have that bad, flat attenuation and it's going to sound natural. If you want to sleep in your hearing protection, you need to make sure it's soft and it's going to be comfortable for you to wear um, overnight and to sleep on your side. So there's a couple of different factors, big things being what are you protecting your hearing from? When are you wearing it? How long are you wearing it? Um, and just what is your goal of the hearing protection? So earplugs are really good at protecting your hearing when um, you don't have control over what you are being exposed to. It's environmental, you're at a concert, whatever it is, you can't turn that volume down yourself. But there's a lot of other noise that we are exposing ourselves to. It's all self-inflicted. So if you are listening to music or podcasts or you're watching TV even, you have to think about what um, volume you are listening at. So uh, again, noise is noise. It can be a podcast, a TV, music, construction, all of it, your ear doesn't know the difference. So you need to make sure that you are always thinking about the noise level. If you are at a restaurant or some sort of situation and say you don't have your uh, earplugs with you, I would recommend to download a sound level meter app where you can actually see how loud is this environment and you can make an educated decision. Do I wanna stay in this environment? How long can I stay in there? And 
be safe? Or is there a quiet part that I can move to, maybe away from the kitchen, away from the do door, away from the bar, put yourself up against a wall, there's other things you can do. Early signs of hearing loss that I would keep an eye out for is usually people start noticing difficulty in background noise. Um, or they, they feel like people are mumbling. They can hear that people are talking, but they can't understand what people are saying. So those are the two most common first reports of someone that has noticed a decline over their, their life. And then all of a sudden it starts creeping into, well, now it's affecting my ability to go out to restaurants or a party and people aren't talking as clearly as they used to. But besides that, I would also keep in mind, again, with the connection with tinnitus and hearing loss, if you develop ringing or buzzing in your ears, that's a good sign that maybe you should get your hearing checked out. Same thing if your ears start feeling clogged. Sometimes people, they they feel like their ears are full, but really it's, it, it's how they are perceiving muffled hearing. It's really more related to the hearing than it is actually having any fluid in your ear or even earwax. They might think it's earwax and then it's not. It's actually reduction in their hearing. So I, I think in general, people wait way too long before they pursue hearing healthcare. And there's been statistics that people wait on average seven to 10 years from when they first start noticing difficulties to when they actually do something about it. I really want to encourage people to just get your hearing tested. There's no harm in getting a hearing test. You don't have to do anything about it. Um, you could just do it to get a baseline and then not do anything from there, but at least you know what your hearing levels are. And then we have more data that if you notice a change, we have something to compare it to. I think there's a lot of things. So your hearing, usually de decline so gradually over time mm -hmm. that um, it's really hard to perceive that decline, that you can compensate and compensate and compensate, and then eventually you cross over some threshold that then, okay, now it's really bothering, really bothering you. But usually people think they're compensating a lot better than they actually are, which is why it's usually like friends or family members or spouses that are saying you need to really get hearing aids and they have to initiate the conversation. So I think it's partially related to how you're losing your hearing and how it's happening gradually. It's partially stigma, it's partially cost, it's partially stubbornness. There's a lot of things. As an audiologist, I think it's really important for people to know that um, prevention is a whole lot easier to deal with and to actually act on than when you have hearing loss. Hearing loss is a very difficult problem to solve, so the best thing you can do is prevent it from happening to begin with. And what's in your control? You wear hearing protection, like earplugs. You make sure that you're watching the volume and how much noise you're exposed to, and all of that will go a long way. I think we will think about noise in the future, like how we now view wearing sunscreen when you're going out, or how we view secondhand smoke. Um, I really think that's what we'll think about when we think of noise in the future, and there's no reason we can't start acting on that now.